This is Reverb. I'm Calvin Pollock. My co-host, whom you'll hear in a moment, is Alex Helberg. This week's episode is our third overall and is the second and concluding part of our series on the politics of security. In the previous installment, which you should absolutely go back and listen to if you haven't already, we talked to Professor Patricia Dunmire about her research on national security discourse. In this episode, Alex and I examine two particular artifacts of security discourse, and we speculate about what a less nationalistic, more holistic conception of security might entail. We hope you enjoy. So with that, there there were a few other things that Calvin and I wanted to brush up on or, or, or do our own sort of analysis uh, of some particular national security artifacts dealing specifically with national security here in the U.S., And there were a couple of things that we mentioned in that interview that we felt that we wanted to return to, the first of which was the uh, press conference that John Kelly gave in the wake of uh, Donald Trump's phone call to the the Gold Star widow of the service member who was killed in uh, Niger. And the question that he got about, you know, well, why are we in Niger in the first place? And his answer to that, I think we wanted to pick apart a little bit because it it speaks to a lot of the things that Patty brought up in the interview. Yeah, it's highly revealing of a lot of the dynamics that Patty was talking about and dynamics that we're interested in separately. Absolutely. Yep. And yeah. so the other artifact that we thought would be interesting for discussing broader trends in security discourse is the January 2017 mm-hmm. Joint Intelligence Assessment from the CIA, the NSA, and the FBI on Russian influence in the 2016 election. We just wanted to go through a a few interesting rhetorical phenomena in that document as well. But I think we're going to start off with the Kelly press conference. Absolutely, yeah. So we'll, we'll we'll play a clip of it here. And again, just to give some kind of context, this was, you know, this episode is being recorded when this issue is still, you know, fairly recent. By the time you're listening to this, this has probably been buried by a whole host of other things. But it's, I think, a really, reve- it's revealing of this dynamic that Calvin brought up in our conversation with Patty about U.S. security discourse feeling like it's more uh, obfuscated. It feels like there's less of an impetus to even talk about the kinds of national security actions that are going on in the world right now, you know, such that we're, we're expected to just kind of tacitly trust what is going on and that it's all being done, not just in the best interest of people here, people living in the U.S., but also of, you know, global security, more, more broadly conceived. So we'll listen to the clip from Kelly, then we'll do a little bit of a breakdown of what he was uh, saying there. So I'm willing to take a question or two on this, to- on this topic. But let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Is anyone here a Gold Star parent or sibling? Does anyone here know a Gold Star parent or sibling? Okay, you get the question. Thank you, General Kelly. First of all, you have a great deal of respect, Semper Fi, for everything that you've ever done. But if we could take this a bit further, why were they in Niger? What was, uh, we were told they weren't in armored vehicles and there was no air cover. So what are the specifics about this particular incident and why were we there and why are we there? Well, I would, I would start by saying there is an investigation. Now, let me back up and say, the fact of the matter is, young men and women that wear our uniform are deployed around the world in their tens of thousands. Uh, in, near the DMZ in um, North Korea, in Okinawa, waiting to go, in South Korea, in Okinawa, ready to go, all over the United States, training, ready to go. They're all over Latin America. Down there, they, they uh, do mostly drug interdiction, working with our partners, our great partners, the Colombians, the Central Americans, the Mexicans. You know, there's thousands. My own son right now in, in, uh, back in the fight for his fifth tour in, uh, against ISIS. Uh, there's thousands of them in, in Europe acting as a deterrent. And they're throughout Africa. And they're doing the nation's work there. And not making a lot of money, by the way, doing it. They love what they do. So why were they there? They're there working with partners, local Africa, all across Africa in this case, Niger, working with partners, teaching them how to be better soldiers, teaching them how to respect human rights, teaching them how to fight ISIS so that we don't have to send our soldiers and Marines there in their thousands. That's what they were doing there. Now, there is an investigation. There's always an investigation. Unless it's a, a very, very conventional death in a, in, a, in a conventional war, there's always an investigation. Um, 
of course, that operation is, is conducted by AFRICOM, uh, that is, uh, of course, works directly for the uh, Secretary of Defense. There is a, uh, and I talked to Jim Mattis this morning, I think he made statements this afternoon. Uh, there's an investigation ongoing. An investigation doesn't mean anything was wrong. An investigation doesn't mean people's heads are going to roll. Uh, the fact is, they need to find out what happened and why it happened. Uh, but at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, you have to understand that these young people, and sometimes old guys, put on the uniform, go to where we send them to protect our country. Sometimes they go in large numbers to invade Iraq and invade Afghanistan. Sometimes they're working in small units, working with our partners in Africa, Asia, Latin America, helping them be better. But the, at the end of the day, they're helping those partners be better at fighting ISIS in North, in North Africa to protect our country so that we don't have to send large numbers of troops. Any other? Any someone who knows, who knows a gold star fallen person. All right. So once again, that was that was John Kelly. Chief when, of staff. Yeah, was, Chief of staff John yeah. Kelly. That was back in late October of 2017 giving a response to why a, uh, an American soldier was killed in Niger. This is, there's a lot going on in this clip in terms of these sort of, you know, rhetorical tactics that are going on. I mean, I thought that we could just start first and foremost by unpacking the baseline justification, you know, of, you know, sort of taking at face value what John Kelly is saying. He's actually, so he's using a lot of similar tropes that, uh, that, that Patty talked about in our, in our interview with her. Specifically, uh, using values like you know human rights uh, mm -hmm. to talk about you know we're you, you know we're we're there because we're teaching people to be better soldiers we're yes. we're there because we're teaching them how to respect human rights so there's yes. this whole kind of this attitude of you know we are the sort of bastion of all those things which I think is you know I mean, we could we could we could have another whole episode dedicated to that as well but it kind of takes as tacit that we are the entity that is spreading human rights or that is spreading you know as he just you know he basically says good in the world we're helping them right. be better we're helping them be good yeah I thought I also think there's an interesting conflation that that mission which seemingly is about liberalizing and democratizing the entire world with protecting our country i mean he, he he returned to this trope again and again of what they're doing is they're in countries all around the world protecting our country mm -hmm. and i'm not sure what necessarily those two have to do to, with each other but mm -hmm. but it seems to be that Kelly is asserting that they they achieved the same objective somehow. Yeah, yeah. Necessarily. Yeah, and to speak to that point too, if we want to infuse that with our discussion of the future as well, there's kind of this implied future that's given again. I think it, I think he repeated it verbatim twice in that clip where he said, you know, we're doing this so that we don't have to send larger numbers of our own troops to these places to you know do whether it's you know drug interdiction or uh, fighting isis or other kinds of forms. or training other or forces training. to fight isis right um, yeah, yeah and 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 that's a very fascinating trope that you see in a lot of different national security discourses even in justificatory discourses about drone strikes it's often framed as we we need to do these drone strikes to forestall potential large-scale intervention so mm -hmm. in a way it, you know it it cuts off anti-war argumentative response before it can even be formed <laughs> yeah. by saying this is anti-war even though it's war it's anti-war because it's preventing a larger war from breaking out in the future yeah that's that's a really fascinating point because it does show one of the reasons why this tactic is so often used and in, uh, in this kind of discourse is because yeah it it kind of bar you know borrows if at least nominally from the value system of the non-interventionist perspective of saying yes. well we don't want to send massive amounts of u.s troops into you know fight in these places they're they're taking as their sort of baseline premise well something's going to happen regardless, you know, like yeah. there, there's going to be some intervention and, you know, in order for it not to be the, massive, the kind of intervention yeah. that's become so unpopular. Right. Um, right. Yeah. We're going to do these small interventions in 130 different countries throughout the world at once. Right. Also another very important and interesting tactic that he engages with there is identity construction, talking yes. about, 
the men and women who put on this uniform mm -hmm. and it seems to imbue them with a kind of positive moral status just by virtue of that. And that's also evident in the sort of discourse moves that he's making on either end of that answer where he's trying to compel other people in the room to identify themselves as having a personal connection yes. to a gold star soldier. There's this sense of ethos that he's constructing yeah, absolutely. Uh, very carefully. I would go as far as to call that a, a bit of a diversion tactic right? because he probably knows that he's going to get questions about what are soldiers doing in this place where n the American public wasn't aware that there was a military conflict or any sort of and There was no necessity authorization for, yeah. presented to Congress. Of, of course, right. yeah. And so in order to put off those critiques or at least to you know pre-frame this sort of a way of immediately making people uncomfortable if they're going to be criticizing military action or to be coming at that point, it's like, well, look who you're criticizing. You know, you're you're criticizing people whose family members have have died in in this sort of you know very honorable way. So you're automatically sort of creating this sort of outgroup for people who might present some kind of dissent, impelling the people who do ask questions to you know. I mean, we heard it in the very response of that first reporter who prefaced his first question with, uh, first of all, you know, thank you for everything you're doing. Semper Fi, we support you in all of this. The second reporter, who we didn't get a chance to hear, did the exact same thing that, you know, right. basically started the question by saying, thank you for your service. And then John Kelly even just said, like, stop it. Just ask your question. <laughs> so, wow. so, but it's, but it is kind of amazing the way that I think that you're correct, Calvin, in identifying that as a, as a move. You're creating the, the basis for how people are supposed to respond right. to what what he had just been saying, which was essentially just about the phone call before and kind of criticizing the member of Congress who kind of broke the story about this very glib phone call between President, between Trump. President Trump and, a, and right. a gold star widow. Yeah, it, it is. It's, it's kind of a way of establishing a, a pragmatic standard for the conversation that yes. you, you don't have a, a right to contribute to the discussion or the debate unless you give this sort of mechanical tribute to the service members, which is which is a, a consistent tactic in, in war discourse and security discourse. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, it plays a lot into kind of as we were talking about as well in the interview with uh, with Patty, you know, where she was talking about this move from security discourse being, you know, more of a, uh, a sanctuary where, you know, the U.S. is supposed to be protecting its interests at home and, you know, engaged in the security of its, of, you know, its people within its borders to more of a, uh, a powerhouse metaphor where now, the expectation is that we, as the U.S. and our, you know, our armed forces, our great partners, to paraphrase Kelly there, right. where it's now our duty to, you know, be going out into the world and to be, you know, the protector of, on their face, these, what would seem to be these kind of positive values like human rights, uh, fighting, you know, fighting drug cartels or, you know, terrorist organizations abroad. It goes into, I think, a lot of what Patty was talking about in the interview as being part of this overall policy of containment. Yes. Uh, this idea that it's the U.S.'s duty to, in it, other, other times it's framed as you know, protecting our interests abroad, or this idea that you know, we, we have to maintain a sense of control over what's happening in the world you know, through whatever, whatever that may be. Right, and so the, the fundamental container metaphor and framing device has not changed it's except that the container has gotten larger right. fundamentally That's and that exactly, shifts yes. from a sanctuary to a powerhouse so now it's not just about containing threats to our homeland like the secure container of national borders from california to new york it's about containing the vast appendages of the u.s empire which extends well beyond the u.s borders to encompass all of the places where our military bases are stationed where our troops are where our special operations our operations forces are where our drones bases are to allow us to continue to serve as this powerhouse that exports democratic values and and liberal identity throughout the world mm -hmm. to protecting and containing threats to protecting that powerhouse and containing threats to that powerhouse. Yeah, precisely. Yeah. Um, well, and, and if we want to shift into our second artifact here, the January 2017 DNI report on Russian influence measures in the 2016 election 
is very much consistent with this container framework. Yeah. And what I think is so interesting about it, and I should mention here that if, if people are interested in studying the container framework more, Paul A. Chilton is a really fantastic scholar to study on this question. He has a great book called Security Metaphors, as well as a book chapter called The Meaning of Security. It gets really deep, deep, deeply into kind of the metaphorical frames that structure the basic understandings of security policymakers and even a lot of international relations theorists, one of which is the container schema. Yeah. And and even if you don't study things like this, if you're listening and you don't study things like this as an academic, it's important because a lot of these, I think a lot of national security discourse, part of what makes it it, you know, it's kind of difficult to analyze sometimes is that, you know, if people don't have that sort of broader contextual knowledge of how the issues are being talked about, books, you know, like the the things that uh, that Calvin is referencing are really useful ways to sort of enter the conversation and get a, get a sense of the ways that it's being talked about so that, you, you know, you can approach it with a little bit more of a critical eye. For sure. Welcome to Reverberations, the segment in which I, Ryan Mitchell, take to the streets and ask people their rapid-fire associations to key concepts from each episode. In this segment, I ask Carnegie Mellon students what springs to mind when they hear the concept national security. What do you think of when you hear the words national security? NSA, Edward Snowden, Russia, how uh, they just go through all their stuff and uh, I have no privacy. I think about those like FBI guy memes. You know what I'm talking about? No. Oh, and there's all of, there's memes on Instagram about the FBI guy who like looks at you from your computer. I think of uh, the surveillance capitalism that's required to keep national security and the movement across borders, right? A kind of tracking of where folks are at a given point in time to understand how they're situated within or outside of a state. So I guess I think when I think of national security, I think of a nation state because you have to have one in order for it to be secure. I think of TSA and think of... CIA efforts um, and target groups like ISIS or Al-Qaeda. I think of a common um, justification that people use in order to excuse uh, violent or military interventions abroad. We start thinking about national security threats or like danger to national security rather than like things that make national security better. You know, like it's always like what's dangerous. I think of, yeah, a lot of insecurity, yeah, fears. I think the first thing that comes to my mind is North Korea <laughs> and nuclear weapons. It's the first thing to come to mind is honestly like Russia cyber attacks is the, the very first thing. Secondarily, I guess it's like stuff that's been in the news recently, like Facebook leaking data. Like, so that's more not necessarily national. Like, but it's both. It's both like personal and national sort of security. Focusing on uh, fear rhetoric targeted towards uh, protectionism. Alex Jones videos. <laughs> So, and he was, talk he was like, just spewing whatever he spews, and he was talking about, like, refugees and just making up stuff about, like, how refugees, like, are corrupting this country and stuff. So I guess that's what I thought of. And, and so with that in mind, I mean, I, I, I think it's hard to talk about national security in a Trump presidency context without talking about the United States relations with Russia right. in the aftermath of the election. So there was this, this report that came out in January 2017, the actual title of which is Assessing Russian Activities and Intentions in Recent U.S. Elections. Mm -hmm. And what I think you know, is the first very interesting rhetorical phenomenon that goes on in this report. And I encourage everyone to give it a read. A lot of it is um, sort of dense and, and hard to get through, but uh, it gives you a, a very interesting window into how the intelligence community is is thinking about 
what went on with Russia in the 2016 election. Yeah. And, um, and so just to clarify, this was a report that was that was sort of co-published by the FBI, the CIA, and the and the NSA, sort of all the major branches of the... The three largest intelligence agencies. And this report does many interesting things in terms of defining the container of the United States, U.S. politics, and, and U.S. elections. So, for instance, there are like very potentially questionable uses of the term foreign as well as the term U.S. as as adjectival modifiers. So there's a statement defining the scope of the report Mm -hmm. that says the U.S. intelligence community is charged with monitoring and assessing the intentions, capabilities and actions of foreign actors. It does not. Sorry foreign actors. I meant to emphasize foreign. Yes. It does not analyze U.S. political processes or U.S. public opinion. Right. So that's presented as a a scope defining statement for this entire report that it's about foreign actors, not U.S. political processes or U.S. public opinion. However, Mm -hmm. as you get into the substance of the report, it's very clear that much of it is about U.S. political processes and U.S. public opinion, at least tacitly, because a lot of what it's asserting that Russia more or less injected into the container of the United States election are things that are not foreign to our political system and and the kinds of arguments that are made all the time in, in political discourse yeah from my own perspective i that that to me was the most troubling aspect of of this we'll we'll get to we'll get to some examples of what that looks like but one of the things that i think is sort of critical to interrogate about a document like this is kind of what calvin was speaking to when he was talking about what exactly is being injected here or what is sort of being claimed to have happened with the 2016 election in russia's words like influence that are thrown around, words like meddling, other times hacking. Uh, In the sort of more colloquial context, we'll often hear things like, uh, you know, Russia hacked our election or Russia meddled with our election. And it's, I think, really important to interrogate what exactly we mean by, by any of those terms that we're using to describe what happened here. Because influence is something that's broad enough and abstract enough to mean a whole variety of different things, all the way from actually getting into uh, the polling systems and messing with things, which there's little evidence to say that that happened. And, and they um, explicitly in this they, report yes. say that, it ha- that they have no evidence. That Precisely. It yep. And or all the way to putting more propaganda and other kinds of media coverage into the U.S. media stream, which is sort of more what their claims revolve around. Or even around, just but... making their own geopolitical decisions mm-hmm. that are entirely independent of our election, but that nevertheless influence it, right? When you yes. use the term influence, you open up a lot of possibilities for what can constitute influence, and not all of those are nefarious or malicious. Precisely, or or again, like I think it's it's crucial to say too, illegal, right, um, or right. or in a lot of as we'll discuss further, out of character for something that the U.S. does in other places too. Absolutely. So, just as an example, they talk about one of the pieces of evidence for the claim that Putin ordered campaign to influence U.S. election. They get into kind of the the intentions of Vladimir Putin as a geopolitical actor in relation to the United States. They get into reasons why he potentially would have ordered a campaign to influence the U.S. election. And there's this line, Putin most likely wanted to discredit Secretary Clinton because he has publicly blamed her since 2011 for inciting mass protests against his regime in late 2011 and early 2012 and because he holds a grudge for comments he almost certainly saw as disparaging him. Mm -hmm. Now, what interests me about this statement is that it isn't clear what evidence this is based on that that is not available to anyone paying a reasonable amount of attention to Russia and to U.S. relations with Russia. It's not clear what this has to do with intelligence or with influence or national security, the kinds of things that these agencies are you know, nominally committed to studying and to getting involved in. To me, this reads as like a very banal judgment of Putin's intentions and what Putin 
is holding grudges about. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Which is again, it, it was very kind of. I th- I thought it was a little jarring to run across uh, yeah. run across words like oh, it's because he holds a grudge for these for these comments. We should also note that that we're not given a lot of evidence here for this claim, and part of the reason for that. Which, you know, we we can talk a little bit more, too, about this statement. You know, at the beginning of every page of the report, there's this quote. This report is a declassified version of a highly classified assessment. Its conclusions are identical to those in the highly classified assessment. But this version does not include the full supporting information on key elements of the influence campaign. So instances right there where they could be extrapolating on evidence that was in this sort of classified report. But again, we don't we don't know that. So it's one of those things that it's difficult to to be able to assess a statement like that as being something that's based on conjecture, based on, you know, different media coverage of of, you know, Putin and his actions or based on intelligence that they actually have access to. Exactly. The the way public does not. In terms of this this distinction between containment. So the container of the United States versus foreign influences Mm -hmm. there's a really interesting annex included with this report which is on the russian kremlin finance television network rt and there's just a part i wanted to read from here where they're talking about documentaries that rt aired i think this was around the 2012 election Mm -hmm. so they're they're judging the possibility of rt's involvement in influencing the 2016 election based on things that it did during 2012 So it says here, RT aired a documentary about the Occupy Wall Street movement on 1st, 2nd, and 4th November. RT framed the movement as a fight against the ruling class, quote-unquote, and described the current U.S. political system as corrupt and dominated by corporations. RT advertising for the documentary featured Occupy movement calls to, quote, take back the government. The documentary claimed that the U.S. system cannot be changed democratically, but only through, quote, revolution. After the 6th November U.S. presidential election, RT aired a documentary called Cultures of Protest about active and often violent political resistance. Mm -hmm. So what this does, and what I would say this report more broadly does, is that it frames dissent, seemingly, as a foreign phenomenon, as something that does not belong in the central container of the United States proper. Yeah. Which is very troubling just in general, but it's also just wildly inaccurate. Yeah. Like I said earlier, this is where the report gets, I think, at its most troubling for me. Because when you read when you read lines like, uh, you know, RT's framing the movement as a fight against the ruling class and described uh, the current U.S. political system as corrupt and dominated by corporations, I mean, again, that's... That's a line that you hear that you don't immediately associate with Russian propaganda. Right. That's not, you know, that is an opinion that exists in the U.S. public sphere in a pretty, you know, I think especially in the wake of the last election, it's a pretty loud voice. I mean, there's clearly an audience for for these kinds of sentiments about this kind of loss of faith in the U.S. democratic system, which, you know, I'm, I'm I'm phrasing it that way because throughout this report, as well there's these kind of you know broad general level lines that the kremlin is directing a campaign i'm quoting here to undermine faith in the u.s government and fuel political protest it's some kind an association in which you know through language you create these sort of implicit links between different entities in the discourse based upon you know adherence to a similar system of values whatever whatever the case might be so in this case, I mean, think about what the move that's being made here is, that this is a documentary that's being made about the Occupy Wall Street movement, as we're, we're assuming we're giving this good faith and assuming that this is a separate entity, that this is not, you know, an entirely, you know, Russian-fueled kind of protest. Those were a lot of the lines that were, that were thrown around a lot in, in Occupy Wall Street, you know, like, we are the 99%. Uh, framing it as this conflict between the maj- the vast majority of Americans and and the sort of one percent or the ruling class. What's being done here is an association is being created between what is I think it's fair to assume is a grassroots political movement and large scale Russian propaganda uh, or you know at least Kremlin financed propaganda. Yeah, and I mean if, even if we're giving a maximally good faith reading of of the argument here it seems to be that 
RT intentionally drew attention to these anti-establishment uh, political movements and moments in the run-up to an election, you know, perhaps for some sort of strategic reason to create chaos, I guess, in the election. But that that also presupposes that ordinary Americans wouldn't be thinking about those kinds of things when they go to vote. And right. I think that as liberals, let's just you know, you know, let, let, let's just assume for the moment that that we are liberals in the liberal academy. We should want that, right? That we we should want um, that. Should, we should want that to be central in people's minds when they're going to vote. Mm -hmm. uh, social movements, yes, uh, you know, actual democratic organizing and popular struggle. We we don't want elections to simply be about partisanship, mm -hmm. uh, about ticking a box, showing up to vote, and 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 that being the end of the story. Mm -hmm. We 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 do talk about democracy as being something that you have to invest in and and earn and put work into mm -hmm. right so even if rt did coordinate its programming around the timing of the election that doesn't necessarily mean that people weren't thinking about these things anyway in the run-up to an election i know that i am precisely in the run up to any election yeah no and i think again the sort of you know popular upswell of support for anti-establishment candidates if you want to if you want to choose that framing like you know bernie sanders as well as as donald trump is kind of i think revelatory of the fact that this is this is a sentiment that exists in public uh you know in the public already that this is you know people are already kind of critical of the way that our political system works, or at least the way that most politicians are dictating what what happens in in Washington and throughout the rest of the world, and I and I just again wanted to do a quick link back to our conversation with Patty Dunmire to say why this is kind of troubling, because she did bring up in our in our interview that uh, national security discourse has uh, I'm kind of roughly paraphrasing here this tendency to clamp down upon or constrain alternative voices uh, and resistance specifically yes. it has the it has this tendency to shut down dialogue about all these sort of different opinions that could exist you know that are part of a healthy democracy questioning the democratic system under which you live is i would argue a a healthy component of a democracy the ability to dissent the ability to to speak an alternative position to what is being fed as sort of like the dominant line to be frank i think that's what we see happening here is that these these popular lines of dissent that we're seeing pop up in all sorts of different social movements are being implicitly associated with this uh, exterior force that is now you know that has kind of breached Infected. the container yeah it's now you know we've been meddled with we've been yes. influenced it's and no longer, yeah, it's no longer coming from within. It's now an, it's an insidious force coming from without. And I would just add to that, the basic conceptual frameworks of national security discourse require that dissent must be coming from without because the assumption is always that the interior container is united, that that unity is essential to maintaining the container mm -hmm. and, and and to maintaining you know our broader mission as a national security powerhouse so to the extent that there's dissent there's disunity it must be coming from elsewhere or else the entire conceptual framework starts to break down mm -hmm. i mean i think you can see that throughout this report in a lot of interesting ways i mean the, the only other thing that i i think I wanted to mention was some of these linguistic tactics of rendering claims or rendering uh, debatable judgments mm -hmm. or uh, arguments, unmodalized assumptions. Yes. Yeah, and we, we should talk a little bit for those who don't know about what, what we mean by when we say unmodalized in linguistics, you know, this term modality is talking about you know the extent to which you you cast doubt or or certainty upon a proposition so uncertainty. you know or uncertainty yeah. yeah so if you're using words like like could uh, or should uh, or things like that these are all examples of different modalizations where you're not giving a definitive explanation of you know something you know x is this um, you know you're saying instead x could be this we'll look at some of the cases where you, there is no 
there is no uh, baseline construction of a premise. Of any sort of premise, any right. sort of asserted claim. It, yes, it's, yeah. it's actually assuming for the purposes of the reader that the claim has already been proven. Precisely. Um, and so if we return to the very beginning of the key judgment section of this report, they say Russian efforts to influence the, the 2016 U.S. presidential election represent the most recent expression of Moscow's longstanding desire to undermine the U.S.-led liberal democratic order. And that's just... Yeah, this is yeah, the, the first this, sentence of the, well, yeah, <laughs> essentially, the, of first, the report. The uh, first full clause. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Not, uh, even the, yeah, not even an entire sentence. Right, and so there we can see Russian efforts... Mm-hmm. Um, that nominalization of effort is uh, assumed. So, yes. so, so Russia or has been part of it's been exerting efforts exactly um, to influence the 2016 presidential election, which the entire document we should mention is set out to prove. Again, they are they are starting with that assertion as uh, unmodalized and a sort of tacit premise rather than you know rather than waiting to have the proof presented first and then making the claim then you have the phrase the most recent expression of moscow's long-standing desire so this assumes that there were previous expressions of moscow's long-standing desire to mm-hmm. undermine the u.s-led liberal democratic order and also that moscow has had a long-standing desire and also that there is a u.s-led liberal democratic order. yes yeah absolutely um, and, and the point here in breaking all of these things down, and this I think this is very important to clarify, the point is not to say all of these assumptions are necessarily false. Of course. Yeah. Right? It's just to point out that when you render them tacit assumptions, you are closing down the possibility of debate or the possibility yes. of conversation. Mm-hmm. And that's consistent with what seems to be the broader political purpose of a report like this Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely you know when we when we talk through again rhetorical theory and a lot of you know what we do in english studies to look at the ways that you know audiences are sort of constructed through a piece of discourse this is often one of the primary ways by which it's done is by you know embedding these kinds of assumptions about you know who you are expected to be as an audience member you're not given options for for different things to believe that you're not given the option to to believe coming out of the gate that Russia has not been, you know, has not exerted effort in doing these things, or that the U.S. is not the leader of the liberal of this liberal democratic order, you're automatically, to, to use another big word, kind of interpolated by that. You are yes. expected to be a person who believes that just by the very language that is contained within this the first sentence of this document. Yeah. So I think I think we should move to. What what could be done differently yes. in the realm of security discourse? How else could we imagine what it means to be secure? What the U.S.'s role should be in the world for determining or guaranteeing or uh, contributing to security as a positive value? And here I just want to go back to Paul A. Chilton. In his, in his chapter, The Meaning of Security, he has a really great section where he offers some alternatives. He talks about ones that have actually already been put out into the discourse but haven't yet achieved the kind of hegemonic status that these various um, discourses we've been talking about in this episode have and these include things like discursive efforts to reorient security thinking around concepts such as common security comprehensive security global commons and environmental stress these expressions require that we negate these container metaphors and these metaphors of force When you use expressions like environmental insecurity, food security, you challenge the baseline imagery that that links security, the military, and the state. You you instead talk about concepts related to basic needs, needs related to the physical safety and survival of individuals, stated in terms of, for example, food provision, shelter, and community. And he has this really great quote that he ends with where he says, Container images will need to be reformulated in terms of physical safety and shelter rather than impermeable containment cordons and the fantasies of defensive astrodomes. Link and path schemas require reformulation as communication, community, and transport rather than paths to permanent stability and quests for ultimate security. Hmm. Um, Security in these transformed senses could be termed basic security. Hmm. So for me... I read that as we should think 
less in terms of the, the security of, you know, the powerhouse container that, that needs to dominate the world with its values and its liberal um, identity, and instead think about guaranteeing material security for as many individuals as possible. And that's going to require a consideration not just of the military and policing, but also of the environment and the economy and education and things along those lines. I don't know. What's your take? Yeah. Who Who is the security benefiting? I right. think that's a question that really doesn't just apply to national security. I think it applies to uh, lots of other kinds of policies. But yeah, the, always, always the question of who benefits, I think, should be should be asked. And in in as far as it's as it's possible we should try and extend those benefits to as many people as possible particularly those who don't enjoy that kind of security that's the or you know basic levels of security i think that needs to really be that's that should be part of our assessment as well is you know not just not just who has it and who gets to retain it but who needs it like who yes. is crucially in need of you know of this kind of security as well the only other thing i'd like to add here is that i think one way of tying together the Kelly artifact and this DNI report is that the DNI report assumes this container notion, this idea that the U.S. election, the U.S. political system should be this hermetically sealed container where no, you know, quote unquote, foreign ideas are allowed in. And that's just farcical. I mean, I, I just think if we're being honest, you can't do that with with a a discursive phenomenon like an election or a political system. There's just no way to you know through sheer force keep out foreign ideas. That's right. just not going to happen. And I yeah. think that when you think about what's happening with the military, as John Kelly informed us, uh, you know they're everywhere. They're all over the world. They're helping people out they're doing all of these wonderful things all over the world i think we need to be very honest about the fact that we've created as i mean particularly when i say we i mean you know the u.s ruling class the u.s military establishment mm -hmm. has created a geopolitical situation where borders don't matter as much as they once did mm -hmm. um and that's going to affect elections that's going to affect affect the political system and it's not as simple as just, you know, as Trump wants to do, throwing up a wall or as, you know, the intelligence community seems to want to do, uh, hermetically sealing off U.S. elections from Russian meddling. I just don't think mm -hmm. that's a realistic possibility. Well, and it's it's also kind of a contradiction in, in policy terms, too, right? The idea that there are no impermeable borders, I mean, only for us, right? right. You know, only, only for the U.S. if we... Again, usually, usually terms like you know spread democracy are used to as, as these kind of I, I would call it a euphemism uh, to talk about things like regime change, right. you know meddling, quote unquote, that we as the U.S. Uh, our our you know institutions have done you know and historically continue and continue to do uh, in other nations as well. I do think that you know we need to be we need to be honest about this kind of you know contradiction in terms and being skeptical of other nations meddling in our in our democratic processes, which again, I'd probably like to see some harder evidence that it actually made a difference. Uh, so far, it's I, most of the things that I've seen have been pretty uncompelling in terms of the extent to which it actually played a role in in making a difference in the election. But I think but, yeah. you're also getting at we need common standards. Yes, right, yeah, precisely. That that meddling from one nation can't be, you know, roundly and consistently and vociferously condemned mm -hmm. when other kinds of meddling are allowed to continue yeah. unabated and even be openly supported. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, yeah, we can't be speaking out of, you know, speaking out of one end saying meddling meddling is okay uh, and then out of the other saying no, meddling is bad. Right. Mm -hmm. Our show today was produced and edited by Alex Helberg and Calvin Pollock. Reverb's web designer is Anna Cook, and our publicity and social media team is Ryan Mitchell and Audrey Strong. You can subscribe to Reverb and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Android, or wherever you listen to podcasts. 
check out our website at www.reverbcast.com. You can also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter, where our handle is at ReverbCast. That's R-E-V-E-R-B underscore C-A-S-T. Thanks for tuning in.